today in Israel. It says this, I will pour out my heart before you, Lord. I will thank you in your presence, my love, because you are my love. You are my Lord, my love. You lift my head. You are my Lord, my love. Blessed Good Friday. Thank you. And for all of you who've been praying for our sister Kirsten, thank you so much. She's, she's here tonight. So good to see you. Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you, God, for the privilege that we have to lift up your name, to say thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Still the sun. 
this hour, I will worship you, my Lord, crying, holy is the Lord on high. In the quiet of my heart, I sing this song.
to sin that I may live again. The precious Lamb of God. Now behold the Lamb. Matthew tell us that on that Friday of Passion Week, Jesus was arrested and he was taken to the high priest's house. And the Bible says that they were trying to find false witnesses against him, but they couldn't find any. The high priest was questioning him and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it that these men testified against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, it is as you say. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the cloud of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, he has spoken blasphemy, what further need do we have for witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered and said, He is the servant of death. Then they spat on his face, and they beat him up. Uh, they struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Messiah, who is the one who struck you? Mm. Mm -hmm. Father, every blow 
every slap, every spit that splattered your face. It was me. It was me. I thank you for absorbing my penalty. I thank you for putting my sorrow upon the cross. I am nothing. You're everything. And we are reminded this week, this whole week, and especially today, but more so Sunday, that you conquered death, you destroyed death, you dismantled death, you dysfunctioned death. Death has nothing on us. May you be with us, speak to us. As we partake of your word, as we partake of this narrative, may it be broadcast throughout the whole world that this indeed is Good Friday. May you bless us with your word. Thank you for the worship. I ask you now to bless us with your presence. Speak to us. I personally thank you for Kirsten being here. I thank you for her. And for everyone else who is battling cancer or any catastrophic illness, I pray you heal them. I pray that you touch them. I pray that you comfort them. So, Father, may, you, may your spirit flow among us and speak to us in a way that you haven't speak in a long time. Father, I see a movement up ahead. I see something happening in our country. The young people are going to rise up. I said the young people, not me. The young people, they will see and they will experience what I experienced in the late 60s and early 70s. It's right for your power, your word, for a revolution to take place, a spiritual revolution. Speak to us, we pray. Go before us as we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn around and say hi to somebody, would you? If this is your first time to the chapel, to the Ark Montebello, would you raise your hand? We just want to welcome you. Anybody? Welcome, 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 welcome. All visitors, you, you get to be first in line to get whatever they're serving. I think they're serving uh, pan dulce and, and abuelita chocolate. So you get first in line. Tell them I'm a visitor, and everybody will let you in in the front. So, so come on down. Un... In 2017, the president, then president of the United States, President Donald Trump, he recognized an act called the Vietnam Veterans, Vietnam War Veterans Recognition Act, and he signed it into law by President Donald Trump. Today coincides with Good Friday, and I just want to recognize all the Vietnam veterans. If you're a Vietnam veteran, would you please stand to your feet, wherever you are. Vietnam veteran, please stand to your feet. God bless you. Anybody else? Vietnam veteran. Anybody else? Good. What I like to do, if I may, Vietnam veterans, there's only, I think there's only two of us right now. <laughs> So I'm going to ask Mandu to come on up. Vicky, Vicky, there you go. We're going to come on up, Mando. And I, I'll be a recipient too, even though I got one this morning. Thank you so much. Mando, we're going to pray for you right now. We're going to pray for you. Say, say mine for me. Thank you so sweetly. Stay here, Mando. Representing, thank you so much. The Vietnam veteran, forgive for my language, but the Vietnam veteran got screwed. Come on up. Oh, my God. David, my God. Come on, David. Love you. Yes, sir. I love you. Welcome home. If you ever meet a Vietnam veteran, don't say thank you for your service. You tell them, welcome home. Because we never got that. 
We never got that. So would you please stand with me? And if you have the courage, would you just say, welcome home? Welcome home. Welcome home. Oh. Amen. 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 Father, I thank you for Mando and David representing many of us, Vietnam veterans. We're dying, Lord. We're getting old. We're dying. So many of us. This is proof that we are dying. Though we are dying, we left an indelible mark in American history, Lord. Father, be with each and every Vietnam veteran, especially those, Father, who are still on the street. Help them be with their families. We celebrate, commemorate this day to acknowledge, even though over 58,000 young men who gave their life, and women who gave their life for this country, be with us. Thank you for these men and those, Father, who will be watching tonight and watching this broadcast later on. Welcome home in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mando. Thank you, David. Thank you, my love. Thank you. You may have a seat. It has been said only two defining forces have ever offered to die for you. Jesus Christ and the American soldier. One died for your soul. The other one was willing to die for your freedom. Amen. Thank you all on this day. Thank you so much. A couple of announcements, if I may. Um, this Sunday, we have Easter services. We're not going to have them outdoors. I must confess to you that when the guys were planning and they said, we want to do it indoors, blah, 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 blah. It's a democratic rule. I don't run, I don't run the ship. It's a democratic rule. So I listened to the leaders, and they said, we're going to go indoors because it may rain. <laughs> I must confess to you, that was twisted. You know what? It's going to rain tonight. It's going to rain tomorrow. It may rain. If we had outdoor, we would have been in a jam. That's where wisdom comes in. There's wisdom among counselors. So I'm so glad they made that decision. But don't tell anyone, I made that decision. But we'll have it indoors. So also, uh, we wanted to accelerate our next service. We're going to have three services. We start, we were supposed to start May 12th. But I thought it was necessary to alleviate the traffic congestion that we're experiencing. So we're going to start right after, uh, a week right after Easter. So the 7th of April. 7.30 in the morning, we will meet in the third building. There, there are no child care. But I must confess to you, if you've been to the third, the third building in, during second service, for some reason, there's people bring food. I don't know why. There's donuts, pan dulce. There's Armenian bread. There's bimbo bread. There's all kinds of stuff they bring. Bananas and fruitcake. I, mean, I don't know why. But it's happening. It doesn't happen in second, it doesn't happen here, but it happens in third building. So I hope it happens again. And come and join us if you're an early bird for the third service. Just to alleviate the traffic for second and third. I think it's, I think it's wonderful to have problems like that. And I think that, I think our society, as I see, I see 1968 and I think 1969 all over again. For those of you that remember 1968, 1969, there were turbulent years. Our country was in a, in a hole, and there was no way out. And then Jesus came and caused a revolution. And I pray that, and I hope to see it. It's not going to be through my generation. It's going to be through the younger generation, because they have no way out. There's nothing for them. There's nothing for them. And I know that Jesus will come. And I know, I hope, and I pray that I'm able to see that excitement. So that's that. Indoors, third service. And they're going to have breakfast wraps, <laughs> breakfast burritos on Sunday. And chile verde burritos. And by the way, Marcy, thank you so much for the burritos. My God. She made a trip to Lupe's, Lupe's Burritos in East Los. And she brought me some yesterday. And uh, thank you, Marcy. Thank you so sweetly. Appreciate it. Thank you kindly. Thank you. 
Would you please turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew? The Gospel of Matthew. I've entitled this message Golgotha. Golgotha. Perhaps for some of you, the first time you see Golgotha. I used to be in a group. In fact, Andy, the drummer, I knew him and I met him in 1975. Andy was a was an East LA drummer for the long time. He's been playing for over 63 years, Andy. East LA Battle of the Bands, Andy. A trucking company and all from East LA. And then we met at a men's retreat in 1981 at a men's retreat, Twin Peaks. When we met, we realized, hey man, you used to be in a band, and so we all met. And we decided to, when we came back down the hill, we said, let's meet. So we will meet at Andy's house in La Puente. And we, will start, we started a group called Golgotha. We took it from the Gospel of John chapter 19, Golgotha. Now, you'd be surprised. When we played at different churches, some pastors and assistant pastors and leaders were asked us, what does Golgotha mean? Is, is that a Japanese animation monster? <laughs> Honestly. Golgotha basically means skull in the Hebrew. Skull. So if this is Calvary Chapel, it will be, it will be Skull Chapel. Because Golgotha, when it was translated into Latin, it's called Calvarius. Where we get a Spanish word, Calavera. Calvary, that's where it comes from. But the name is a place of infamy. It's a place where something happened that changed the whole world. The worst day in the history of all humanity is remember as Good Friday. Why? Because no day in history have humans been loved so much. It is also known as Holy Friday, Get Great Friday, Black Friday, Mournful Friday, Silent Friday, Long Friday, or Easter Friday. What a supreme paradox. We now call the day Jesus was executed and crucified as good. Good Friday is one of the most misunderstood phrases we have in the world. But the word good really reflects a very old meaning of the medieval word good. G-O-O-D-E. Good. The word good translates as sacred or holy, so it's really Holy Friday. I share with you, for those of you that were here yesterday, a quote from a radical, wonderful teacher by the name of Leonard Ravenhill. He said this, quote, Gethsemane is where Jesus died. The cross is only the evidence. What does that mean? It means that Jesus actually died to himself on the Garden of Gethsemane. If you were here yesterday, we read about the Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible said that Jesus was sorrowful unto death. He couldn't breathe. He was in sorrow. He was he was exasperated with pain and sorrow and difficulties and stress. So much stress that he began to sweat droplets of blood in his forehead. And he asked God, if there's any other way, please let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but let your will be done. So when you read Hebrews, you come to a place where Hebrews says, For the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross and the shame. So when you connect the dots, he died on Gethsemane. He went to the gruesome execution, but there was joy in his life. Why? We are told that because he knew what will be the purpose of that day. Now, joy, you, you must understand, the Bible said the joy of the Lord is our, say it loud with me, strength. It wasn't goofy joy. It wasn't tiny team walking to the tulips kind of joy. It is a joy that came from within. Yes, there was pain. Jesus could have called any time a legion of angels to come in and intercede, but it was humility. It was his kindness. It was his grace that kept it going. Now, in the gospel of John, in John chapter 19, Verse 17, we read this, Jesus, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, 
which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. The Gospel of John states that Golgotha was a place well known. It was close to the city. Golgotha was outside the city walls. According to Hebrew 13, 12, Jesus also, that he may sanctify the people with his own blood, suffer outside the gate. We are told in John 19, 41, there was a garden in it. And in the garden, there was a tomb, which was a property of Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy, secret follower of Jesus Christ. Now, time does not permit us to go through the whole narrative. We'll pick it up in chapter 27, verse 32. But as the staple singers will say, let me take you there. I'll take you there. The Bible says that right after the Garden of Gethsemane, that Jesus already knew that his betrayer was at hand. His name was Judas. And as soon as he finished in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas came up. And he gave a signal to the troops that were arresting Jesus. He said, the man whom I kiss, that will be the one. So Judas, the rancor, <laughs> comes and kisses him. And he says, what are you doing, friend? Betraying me with a kiss? And sure it was. We are told that Jesus was arrested. Jesus was taken to Anna's house first. Then he was taken to Caiaphas, two religious leaders. One is the real high priest. The other one is the wannabe high priest. His son-in-law is the high priest, but Caiaphas is a shot caller. It was during this kangaroo religious court that Jesus gets slapped on. They couldn't kill him because there was against Roman law to execute anyone. And they had no ground to execute Jesus. So they take him to Pilate. So the Bible said they took him to Pilate. And it was early in the morning, we are told. Now you have to reckon the days and the times because some people don't understand that. You see, if we were living in Israel right now, the sun went down. This will be considered, uh, it will be considered, what's today? Friday. It will be considered Saturday already. So Jesus was on Thursday, like around 7 o'clock at night. That will be considered already Friday. And it wasn't until they arrested him, and by 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, they took him to Pilate's house, to the, to the praetorium. And Pilate said, what, do you, what has he done? He said, if I lay the law, well, then you take him and deal with according to your Jewish law. And they said, we're not. We cannot kill him. We cannot execute him. And the Bible says that thus fulfilling prophecy, that Jesus had to die by the cross. Now, the crucifixion was very common in the Roman world. Everywhere the Romans rule, from Spain to England to Germany, the German, I mean, the Romans, they executed people in the most horrendous way, execution by crucifixion. It was not unique only in Jerusalem. We now know it because of Jesus Christ, but the Romans, they were very shrewd. It was, it was called the, the Pax Romana. You violate the Roman law, execution immediately. But the Romans in, that did not invent crucifixion. It is called literally impalement. Impalement is when some instrument goes into the body. Some people fall from buildings and they, 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 they flop against the fence and they get impaled. So the word impalement is from the antiquity. The people that were known for their cruelty were the Assyrians. The Assyrians were barbaric. The Assyrians were animals, the way they tortured. They were very fearful. We read in scriptures of their tactics, how the Assyrians will go into a town, a village, a city, and they were shock troops. What they would do to shock people into submission was to shock them. And one of the tactics was to go into the village, look for a pregnant lady who was probably in her seventh, eighth month, and they will 
bring her in front of everyone. They will rip the belly open and they take the fetus out and they smash the fetus up against the rock. It will shock people. They were known for the cruelty. The cruelty that happened October 7th in Israel is the same kind of cruelty. I'm not into politics or propaganda. I have friends, they witnessed the video for 47 minutes. And the video is not taken by the Israelis. The video is taken from, from their own perpetrators, what they did. And it's too gruesome for the human mind to watch this because it will burn you up. And you say to yourself, how can these people do this animalistic stuff? It's still happening. The Assyrians were horrible. One of the tactics, and I keep it PG, I hope you understand it. One of their, one of their tactics was to impale men. What they would do, the first thing, they would strip them naked, part of the humiliation. And then they will imagine a, a number two pencil, but it's a tree shaped like a pencil, sharp. And men will force the captive, much to his horror and dismay, they will pick him up and they will try to jam that pole. Hopefully, it will go through his mouth. He will not die. It's just like a stab wound. If people get stabbed and they keep the blade on, you leave it there. It works as a suction. My girlfriend, my wife, was working in 9800 LA County, USC, Unit 1. And she worked at 9800. <laughs> and I work at Unit 1, 1060. And I would go visit her at times. And her unit was always, always a chaotic situation. So I went to visit her one day. And a homeboy with his IV, he's walking with his IV. And there's a knife stuck to his chest. With a note saying, please do not remove. Disgusting. My hand to God. And he's out there walking around with his IV with a knife stuck to his head. Kitchen knife. Hey, home, you got a frago? I go, no, no, I don't smoke. But I, I wish I had one so I can see him smoke to see if it comes out. I don't know. <laughs> so the impalement would work and it was constructed to make the victim suffer long. So the Romans... They mechanized crucifixion. They made it more, more painful. They put the cross. They put a little seat in the rear so the victim can sit on it and rest. They would have a little, a little, a little podium under the soles or feet so they can raise up. And they will sit for a while only to elongate the misery. Some crucified victim will go like five days days at times. Remember, it was a holy day, so they didn't want to have bodies hanging. So they asked Pilate, hey, take the bodies down. They're not dead. So what did they do? They went and broke the victim's legs. Why? So they can die immediately to, if, by way of asphyxiation. So they went and knocked the, the kneecaps of one of the victims. They went to the other victim, and boom, they knocked him out. And they were going to knock Jesus' knees out. But the Bible says he was already dead. Thus, fulfilling prophecy that the Lamb of God shall not have any broken bones. Fulfilling Scripture again. So, they take Jesus. Pilate. He says, Jesus, privately, are you a king? And Jesus said, I am. He said, but my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, we will fight. But we're not of this world. People that know the truth follow me and they hear my voice. And Pilate said, what is truth? But Pilate had a heart. 
In fact, when he was interrogating Jesus, he gets a messenger or a note from his wife. And the note or the messenger said, have nothing to do with this just man, for I have dreams about him. Please don't have anything to do with him. So that added more pressure for Pilate. Pilate goes back, and he wants to sympathize with Jesus. And he asks, what evil has he done? What evil has he done? So, I don't know. Can I? Give me the next one. I don't know. It don't work. Can I have the next one? Oh, thank you, Lisa. As Pilate is interrogating Jesus, we change channels, and we see another scene where Judas has a change of heart. He, uh, he re regret, not repentance, regret. And he comes in, he says, I don't want the 30 pieces of silver. And they said, no, we don't want it either. He threw the 30 pieces of silver. And he went and hung himself. The Bible says that the religious leaders didn't want nothing to do the money because there was blood money. That's where it comes from, blood money. So out of benevolence, they go and open up a burying place <clears throat> called the potter's field for strangers that would die. So Judas, the betrayer, he's gone. Pilate, still having second thought. He knows that they brought Jesus for envy. He wants to help him out. He wants to know why. As a political weasel, he begins to think, hmm, hmm. It was customary, according to the Passover, it was customary to release one prisoner as a symbol of Passover. So Pilate thought, hmm, I'm going to go get me the most ugliest guy, the most heinous, the most murder, the most ugliest dude, and then I'm going to see. So Pilate brings Barabbas. He was not a good man. Just like today, uh, people who are bad criminals, they're letting them out of prison. They're letting them out. And here you see an example. Pilate thought, I'll bring the worst guy to, of society. Surely the people will have sympathy. So he says, <clears throat> it's customary to release someone from prison on Passover. I, wanna, I want you to decide, who should I release? Should I release Barabbas? He comes out all messed up. Being in the dungeon for long, he comes out. Everybody knows he's a thug, 187 PC, he's a thug. You want me to release Barabbas? Or your king of the Jews? To his dismay and shock, the people say, release Barabbas. Barabbas. Jesus said, then what should I do with this man? And they said, crucify him. And Pilate said, why? What evil has he done? But he's still tactical. So, the Bible says that before he let Jesus go, that Pilate sent him to get scourged. Another Roman tactic. Before crucifixion, the victim will be whipped and lashed. Most people would not survive the lashing. Extreme blood shock. Now, I selected these pictures because, you see, they're goofy pictures. Look at Jesus. You see any blood in here? That's what the artist wants to render to you. That tells me that the artist never read his Bible. Many artists never read their Bible. They just write and they paint it what they thought it would be. Sometimes they will, they will put a little halo around to tell the viewer that that's a saint. But this is not a real picture of flogging. It's a horrible, despicable spectacle. Blood shock. Horrifying. So the Bible says that they took Jesus, a whole garrison took him. They begin to mock him, to scourge him. They, they took a crown of thorns and they jammed it on his head. 
And they gave him a reed, and they put on a, a, a fake coat, and they begin to mock him. Hail, king of the Jews, they will bow down. And then the Bible said they begin to spit at him, took the same reed from his hand, and they begin to beat him in the head. Wow. Beat him in the head. Beat him in the head. So when he was all jacked up, we can read from Isaiah. Isaiah paints a picture. Isaiah says that his face, his visage was marred. One commentator and scholar said that his face looked like hamburger meat. You couldn't even recognize him. So Pilate thought he had an idea. He will, he will seek the pity as Jesus came back all bloody and messed up. There's a famous picture there. It's called Eche Homo. Eche Homo. Is the Latin phrase that means, behold the man. He thought he would elicit pity as the religious leader saw Jesus all beat up. But again, they pursued, crucify him. So Pilate emulates a Jewish custom. <clears throat> he ordered a basin of water publicly. And in front of all the accusers, he did what the Jewish nation were accustomed to do when you did not want blood guilt. He says, I wash my hands from this man's blood in front of them. And you know what they said? Let his blood be upon us and our children. I don't know what you think of that. But that's horrible. Very dishonorable. So Pilate gives him away. The Bible says that they took him. And Jesus picks up his cross. And again, if, if history tells us right, Mr. Mel Gibson wanted to do the thing right. You see, the cross is a T cross. But according to the ancient world, the Bible says that, that the victim will carry only the horizontal beam. The vertical beam was always in place of the execution place. Every Roman colony had an execution place. It was very common. Crucifixion was very common. So they will take their cross. Another feature of crucifixion is that they will put a sign. It's called in Latin, titulum, or titulo, or title. They will have his crime. As he will go through the way to the execution place. Tradition calls the way of sorrow, they call it via dolorosa. The painful road or the sorrowful road. That's tradition. Tradition said that he stopped at certain stations. No, no victim will do that. Oh, station number one. Let me kick back. Oh, station number two. That's just a tradition. It's beautiful, beautiful tradition. But it's not. It's fancy. It's not historical. So the, the, the stations of, of the way of the Via Dolorosa. But we are told that Jesus was walking, taking the cross. And at one point, he wasn't able to carry the cross. You can imagine the shock, the blood shock. He couldn't carry it. So the Bible tells us that a man from Cyrene by the name of Simon, who was a pilgrim, he came in and the Romans in conscripted him. Because that was a Roman law. When the Roman soldier was, had a backpack and he was able to carry it, he had the right, according to the Roman law, to get anybody who goes, you carry my backpack. That's why Jesus, when someone forces you to walk a mile, he says, walk two miles. So he was conscripted, carry the cross. And Simon and Jesus, they walk to this place called Golgotha. Again, it's a goofy picture. I know. Now, from the 1400s, there's a place in Israel. It's called the Church of the Sepulchre. 
That is the most highest Christian pilgrimage, number one. For people around the world that are Christians, when they go to Israel, that is the number one place they want to go all over the world. That's the place. Because they believe since 1400 that that's the place where he died and that's the place where he resurrected, the church of the sepulcher. Now, I've been to Israel 28 times. I've only been to the church of sepulcher three times or two times, I believe. I don't like it. Why? It's spooky. It's dark. There are fights that happen inside. Fights? Oh, yeah. Between who? Between the priests. They fight. Look it up. You two. Fights? <laughs> priests. Because they, they argue over who's who. You have the Armenian Orthodox. You have the Greek Orthodox. You have the Catholic. And, you, and so they fight inside. In fact, they're not, they don't even have the key. For hundreds of years, a Muslim has the key. Now, there's another place called Gordon's Tomb. And that's outside the city. The church's sepulcher is inside the city. And the Bible said that Jesus was crucified outside the walls. That's what the Bible says. So you look at the existing wall and the ancient wall that was there before, and there's no way. And then the Bible is wrong. Now, I'm not agreeing that Garden's tomb is the place, but it, it's more probable. Because there is a garden. There is a mountain that has the, 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 it has the distinction that looks like a skull. But between you and I, I don't care where it's at. I don't care. See, when my wife got healed from brain cancer, I didn't ask, well, how did that work? She was healed. I'm not going to give a, what happened? Was it, was it the chilaquiles I made? Or was it? What was it? Was it the menudo I made for her? Was it the rub down that I did? What was it? I don't know, and I don't care. She was healed. The same thing with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He rose from the dead. From where people split hairs. But I'm telling you, two years ago, three years ago, uh, 2021, I went with Millie to Israel alone. And I took her to, I took her to the church sepulcher just for her to trip out. I didn't go. I let her go by herself. And she came back. She goes, oh, it's weary, it's trippy. I know it is, man. So what happened, as she went in, I went to the door, and I sat by a bench there. A guy comes up to me. He just looked like a homeboy. Forgive me, Mando, but he looks a lot like you. <laughs> he look, you'll see in the picture right now. So he comes over there, and he tells me, like, he gives me the look like, hey, what the heck? Get out. And I'm thinking, this is a free country, fool. But before I said anything, he was interrupted by people. They want to take a selfie with him. Oh, and then I realized, oh. And then he came back again to tell me, but he got stopped again. And he, wow, he's a shot caller. So I respected him. Okay, I'll get out. And I come to realize he's the one, a Muslim, that holds the keys to the sepulcher. This is the church of the Holy Sepulcher. This is the most visited pilgrim place in all the world since 1400. This is the place, they said, where Jesus was buried and resurrected. There you see the spectacle that goes on, the beauty, the, 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 the tradition that goes back years. People, when they open up at 4 in the morning, there are people on their knees at 4 o'clock in the morning trying to get in, and they kiss everywhere. They kiss the slab. It is just a scene to see. There's Mr. Waji Nushibe. See, Mando, your cousin. <laughs> he opens the key to this place. No Christian is allowed to hold the key because they fight over the place. So it has to be a Muslim. Think about it. For years, a Muslim opens it up 
every morning. And there he is in the middle. And there's the key. It's a really fanfare to see, open it up. People, people stay up for like two, three hours so they can see the spectacle. I ain't got time for that, man. <laughs> Enjoy my little Jewish coffee. Forget all that. And there's the bench that I was sitting in. And he gave me that look. Then I recognized him. And there I am with him, right there. <laughs> I made friends with him. He, he's all, oh, you know, Habibi, Habibi, what's happening, man? It was beautiful. All this to share with you that I've been there. And if you're like me, I hope you're like me. I don't care where he was raised. I don't care. He rose from the dead, period. He beat death. I don't care what he did. It could be Barstow. It could be Tijuana. I don't care. He rose from the dead. For me to say, well, it was here, it was there. It doesn't matter. And there's Nellie and I. Oh, hey, baby. <laughs> so we'll pick it up. Go with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, verse 27. We'll pick it up there. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman garrison around him. And the Romans stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say the place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, Jesus would not drink of it. You see, the ladies of fine class of Jerusalem wanted to give the victims a little bit to take the edge off. It was a narcotic. It was some kind of, of, of gall to drink. When Jesus tasted it, he refused it. In a moment, you'll see that he does take, yes, sour wine. The word sour wine, sour wine it means... In, in Latin, vino agrio. In Spanish, it just means sour wine. It doesn't taste like wine. It tastes like vinegar, which that's what it is. Vinegar is vino agrio, vinegar. So Jesus does take that, but not this. Verse 35. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, which is David, Psalm 22, 18. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they watched over him there, and they put over his head the accusation written against them. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. So what you see here is that I'm sharing with you. It is the titulos, and they're written both in three, in three language. I share with you in a moment. No, I can share with you now. They were written in three languages. Latin was the official language of the Roman Empire. It represented human government, power, and conquest. Greek was the international language of culture and commerce. It represented human wisdom, art, and commerce. Hebrew was the religious language of the Jews. It represented the covenant race, the law of God, and the means by which God made himself known to man. In the providence of God, all of these human and divine institutions were addressed in Golgotha. John tells us that when, he, when Pilate put that name, that the religious leaders, don't write that, said that he said he was the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. That's the word. In verse 38, Jesus is crucified. Then robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed, wagging their heads and saying, 
You who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. So Jesus was in an intersection where there's foot traffic. It was designed like that. The Romans did not want to hide crucifixion. They want to glare it and open in the face of the community. What would that do? It will shut them down. This is what would happen to you if you go against the Roman law. So as there were people walking by, they begin to blaspheme him. Notice verse 41. Likewise, even the religious people, the chief priests, also mocking with the scribes and elders. And they were saying, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Verse 44. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Son of God. Now, if you were to read Matthew only and not read the rest of the chapters, you will miss out. Luke tells us something very unique about these robbers. In the book of Luke, we are told that the robbers were blasting him. And they were reviling him. But one of the 187 PCs has murdered. One of them looked over Jesus and looked at the other guy. He says, and I paraphrase, okay. He said, amen. You and I deserve why we're here. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he turns to Jesus. He says, Lord, when you get to your kingdom, remember me. Just like that. Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. What does that mean? Here's a man who has lived a heinous life. In the last few seconds of his breathing life, he comes to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That was amazing. That happened to me, Long Beach Memorial. He got a call here, and he says, you know, uh, we call our priest, and he doesn't want to come. They want, he charges. He said, can you come? I don't, know who, I don't know who they are. I just went. This is around 20 years ago, lesson learned. When I got to the hospital, uh, there's always a group of family. He's a great-grandfather. So that means he had children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. So they're all gathered in the lobby. And you see the scene, right? When they know that grandpa's not going to make it. Dad's not going to make it. Grandpa's not going to make it. Great-grandpa's not going to make it. So there's always a little group of people. They're believers. They're the ones that call me. And the family is divided. You can tell the believers, they're praying, and they're, they're smiling. And the other ones who have no hope, they're crying and they're, they're inconsolable and they don't know what to do. And I was warned. He said, listen, my father, my grandpa, he's a nasty dude. He, he will cuss you out. He uses foul language, blah, blah, blah. He hates, he hates people like you. Okay. <laughs> I walk in ready to just to posture myself. I don't mind profanity. I'm, I probably cuss worse than him. I was ready. But here's a man. He's probably like 87, 88 years old. There was no fighting. He looked at me. Weak. I said, you know, you're going. Would you like to make peace with God? The guy said, I've been waiting for you. I want to make peace with God. Just like that. I led him to the Lord. Walked out and I looked at the family. They're Christians. I look at the family. Gave them the nod like, we're in, man. <laughs> the other people have no clue what's going on. And then in five minutes, I hear. <laughs> and all the unbelievers go in there and cry, cry, cry. The believers come up to me and I told them. Grandpa received the Lord before he went home. Wow. Wow. I got into my car. I was so happy. And then I started realizing, that's jacked up. Homeboy lives like hell. He lives like hell. And then in the last 30 seconds of his life, Jesus, I come to him. 
Then I realized, what is that to you? What is that to you? I operate differently. And I had peace as I read a parable of Jesus. He hired people. I'll give you a denarius if you work for me. So the guy worked for 12 hours. He hired another guy. He only worked for eight hours. He hired another guy. He only worked four hours. There was another guy who only worked for one hour. And when they got paid, he paid the guy with an hour and four hours. And, and then the guy that had eight hours, he goes, okay. He goes, here's your thing. The guy says, why do you pay me this? I worked eight hours. This guy only worked for one hour. Jesus said, what is that to you? I hire you for a denarius. Shut up. And that's when I learned my lesson. The grace and the kindness of God. We are told that the women of Galilee stood afar. They never ranked out. People left the scene, not the women. I want you to know that. I have four girls. I want you to know that. They love Jesus. The women ministry here is very powerful. I want you to know the women have a role to play. Women have a role to play. I know that's not right nowadays. But the women are faithful. Back then, they are still now. Very faithful. And here you see all the ladies from Galilee waiting and watching him. Verse 45 says, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, Sabbatani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, Jesus was executed, was put on the cross at 9 a.m. From 9 to 12, there's some utterances that Jesus said. In Luke chapter 23, 34, he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. The second utterance in Luke 23, 43, are surely I say to thee, today you will be with me in paradise. In John chapter 19, 26, the Bible says he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to his disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. And then at 12 o'clock, from 12 to 3, there was utter darkness for three hours, from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock. It was during the darkness that Jesus once again cried out, Eli, Eli, Sabbatani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? John 19, 28, the Bible says that Jesus said, I thirst. In Luke 23, 46, the Bible says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And in John 19, 30, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Done. What a wonderful, what happened on this Good Friday. Simple. Jesus paid a debt you and I could not pay. He was a substitutory atonement, a substitute, a person or thing that takes the place or function of another. According to the scriptures, it was a substitutory atonement. I want you to know that Jesus was not a victim of circumstances. There are people who say, oh, poor thing, you know, they jacked him up. Oh, the Jews messed him up, the Romans. No, they did not. Jesus said, no one takes my life away from me. I have the right to lay it down. I have the right to pick it up again. I lay down my life as my own sacrifice. No one takes it from me. He was not a victim of circumstances. Now, I close with this. There's a little tidbit scripture in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. There we are encouraged to run the race. As we have many witnesses in heaven, let us run the race. Don't get discouraged. And when you do get discouraged, we are told to look to Jesus. And look for what? For the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Enduring the cross, bearing the extreme hardship without giving up, despising the shame, disregarding the negative, destructive emotions. And joy that was set before him, a profound emotion 
that fueled, encouraged, motivated the Lord to be expectant, peaceful, confident, grand, majestic, and hopeful. And it was sitting and reigning at the right hand of God. Now, what creates discouragement? Ooh, I can go on. I can, I can be here for half an hour. Discouragement, financial, marital, children, health, head trips, mental anxiety, stress, unemployment. I can go on and on and on and on and on. But what creates encouragement? Look to Jesus, who endured the cross. Know that we're living in constant change. We read from Joshua, God will never leave you nor forsake you. God is making you just like him. God is forging character through the fiery trial and the anvil of life. Losing is winning according to the economy of Jesus Christ. Losing is winning. Luke 9, 14, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses my, his life for my sake will save it. And I have one more thing. I don't know why I put it here, but I think it's important. Laughter is good medicine. Don't let anything or anyone steal your laughter or your smile. Whoever or whatever takes your smile and your laugh has destroyed your God. You can take me, you can take my home, you can, you can, you can put me in poverty, but you cannot take my salvation, you cannot take my peace, you cannot take my joy, you cannot erase my name in the book of life. You can't do that. I'm not going to live forever, man. I know there's going to come a day when I will graduate from this world. I'm not an idiot. I'm going to live forever. Oh. So when you look, heaven is not just a destination. Heaven becomes a motivation. So the Lord be with you. We'll partake of communion right now. I'll ask Chris and the band to come up. I close at 8.09. We're going to close at 8.20. I'm letting you know 11 minutes, 11, 12 minutes of worship as we partake of communion. Now listen, I've been wrong all this week. I said, who would come on, on the weekdays to service? Uh, Christians, but I've been wrong. I've been wrong Monday, I was wrong Tuesday, I was wrong Wednesday, I was wrong Thursday, and I'm wrong today thinking that everybody's here a Christian. No. You see, like the thief, you're going to have to respond. You can be one thief and say, eh, whatever, man. Or you can be like the other thief. In, in, in 11 seconds, his whole life was changed. You too can make that decision. I don't say, would you like to change religion? Or would you like to change religion? Or would you like to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? That's a given. You see the thief on the cross, Jesus didn't say, well, you have to accept me. The man said, remember me when you get to your kingdom. That's a confession. And that's a confession is made. So what I asked the man who was dying, I didn't get time for theology. I didn't have time for all that. I just told the man who never cussed at me, never used profane words. He looked at me and he says, I've been waiting for you. And I said, would you like to make peace before you die? That's a question. There are times when people are intubated and they're going to die and they cannot express what they say. So I ask people, just squeeze my hand if you want to have peace in your heart. And they squeeze my hand. Boom. And I lead them in a very simple prayer to receive Jesus. And that's for you today. But I'm going to ask you that this is Good Friday. People can raise their hands. That's fine. But I'm going to ask you if it's okay with you. In a moment, I will ask you to stand to your feet. You're going to realize that I'm not, I don't have that kind of power to force you. But you're going to feel something. You're going to feel here something. And from here, it will navigate here to your mind. And then your mind will take over. And everything will work and click. And you will say, that's what I've been looking for. I knock. I knock at the, at the door of your heart. If you open it up, 
I will come in and I will sup with you. You don't have to. But I really hope that today will be the day when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you make peace with him. If that is you and you would like to receive him and make peace with God today, would you stand to your feet? Would you please let me pray with you, whoever you are. Just stand to your feet quickly, whoever you are. Just stand. Just stand. God bless you, man. <laughs> Remain standing. Remain standing. Remain standing. I pray that your eye gets better. I pray that you get healed from your eye in Jesus' name. Anybody else, quickly. Anybody else. Don't leave without Jesus. Anybody else. Anybody else, quickly. The only thing that's holding you is pride. For once in your life, tell pride where to go. Anybody else, quickly. Anybody else. Are we good? Are we good? For those of you that are standing, welcome to the kingdom of God. Will you repeat this simple prayer after me? And afterwards, partake of communion with us. You're in the brotherhood now. Dear Jesus, please forgive me. I repent of all my sin. Jesus, come into my heart as my personal Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me a new life, a new heart, and a clean conscience. And put my name in the book of life forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Let's all, well done. Let's, let's worship and pass. They're going to pass communion cups. And we'll, we'll, we'll pray together. book of Hebrews tells us this, that as he went to the cross, he has forgiven all our trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirement that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out, out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. 
We gave you a little two by five card. Don't put your name on it, okay? But whatever ails you, whatever inconvenience, whatever crisis, whatever tragedy, whatever desire you want. Mary, lady, see if you want a child, let him know. Flower my womb, Lord. Guys, ladies, I'm single. I just want to mingle. <laughs> it's okay. But don't put your name on it. And there's a cross in the front. Nail it to the cross or drop it in the basket. We will look at it. We will burn it tomorrow like incense and your prayer will go up. That's what they were for. Don't leave this property without reconciling with God. God loves you. This is Friday. It's very painful. But Sunday is coming. Amen. Mm. Great Lord, we thank you for allowing us to partake of communion. You remind us over and over again that we do this in remembrance of you. Why do we have to be remembered, Lord? Because we need to know that you love us unconditionally. Father, this world is horrible. The flesh is despicable. We failed you. In this world, Father, we have tribulations, but we want to have cheer just like you. Help us, we pray. We recognize that this bread symbolizes your broken body that was nailed to the cross. This cup represents your precious blood that was shed for our sins, for the forgiveness of our sins. Remind us that our name is written in the book of life. We ask you to be, Father, with each and every one of us in whatever trial, whatever station in life, whatever we're going through in our private world, Father. I pray, Father, that you will hearken unto us as we cry out, Lord Jesus, be with us. We thank you. We love you. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Take a breath. If you can, I urge you to stick around. I ask Chris to do two songs of worship, and then Chris will dismiss you. God bless you. After the two songs, we'll see you at the food court, Lord willing. God bless you. Love you.
light of day or tears of night bless the